We're going to look at Acts 5, verse 17, to the end of the chapter. It's a long passage, so I'm actually going to read through it as we go through the um, sermon. But uh, let me get just a couple verses just to start. I want to back up just to uh, verse 14. It says, And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their numbers, to such an extent that even, uh, they even carried the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. Also the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. But the high priest rose up, along with his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles, putting them in a public jail. Well, I won't back down. No, I won't back down. You can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. No, I'll stand my ground, won't be turned around, and I'll keep this world from dragging me down, gonna stand my ground, and I won't back down. You ever heard of the stand your ground laws? They're laws that many states have that allow a person to use deadly force to defend themselves if they reasonably believe that their life and safety is being threatened. One of the most important test cases for this law happened in our own state back in August of 2020, when a young man named Kyle Rittenhouse was arrested for fatally shooting two men and wounding another in a protest in Kenosha. Well, the spark that ignited the week-long protest was a shooting by police of a 29-year-old black man named Jacob Blake. Now, during the day, people marched and chanted, but when the sun went down, the violence began. Demonstrators smashed windows, set fires, two garbage trucks, a trolley car, and 100 vehicles at a car dealership were torched in the first night alone. By the second night, Governor Evers called out the National Guard to protect firefighters and critical infrastructure. That move was opposed by the American Civil Liberties Union, who claimed that people had a First Amendment right to protest and, quote, to demand an end to the epidemic of police violence and the systematically systematically harmed and killed black and brown people for generations. Now, the arsonists continued their fight for social justice by lighting on fire uh, the parole office, a furniture store, apartment building, and several homes. Officials pleaded for more National Guardsmen to be sent in. Well, the next night, the rioters lit another 34 fires and engaged in looting. They shot fireworks at the police officers. By the time the mayhem had ended, by the end of the week, 40 buildings had been destroyed and 100 damaged. The estimated cost of repair was $50 million. Well, it was during one of those nights of rioting that 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse joined others armed men to protect property from rioters. At one point in the night, Rittenhouse was chased by Joseph Rosenbaum, who, uh, when he caught Rittenhouse, grabbed his gun and Kyle fired. Rittenhouse was shot four times and he died on the spot. Another man, Anthony Huber, struck Rittenhouse in the head with his skateboard and was shot as he was tussling with Kyle for his gun. A third man, Gage Grossgrutz, pointed a gun at Rittenhauer's head, but Kyle shot him in the arm. So he was arrested, charged with two counts of homicide and one count of attempted homicide, along with a number of lesser charges. Now, if you recall the media reaction they came out fast and furious in their reporting. Some outlets stated that he had murdered three black men, not true, or that he was a neo-Nazi white supremacist. Worse yet, he was a Trump supporter. He was labeled a domestic terrorist. Well, at his trial, the prosecuting attorney portrayed Rittenhouse as a vigilante who went to the riots looking to make trouble, and that he was actually the one who had provoked the incidents in the first place. The defense lawyers in their stead argued that Kyle had been acting in self-defense when his life was clearly in danger, and so he had the right to stand his ground. Rittenhouse won his case and was acquitted of all charges. Now, hopefully, you will never be put in a situation where you have to use deadly force to defend either yourself or your family. But Christians, all Christians, are called upon to stand their ground 
when it comes to defending the truth of the gospel. For we've been given a clear command by Christ who said, All authority has been given unto, to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Now, the fulfillment of that command comes through the preaching of the gospel, which, though it's good news, it's usually rejected and often opposed, especially by those who are in power. Well, today, we have a story of the disciples taking a stand for truth, the truth of the gospel. And though they were arrested and beaten and forbidden to spread the message, they insisted that they would stand their ground and they would not back down. Well, to encourage you to stand your ground, we want to consider this portion of God's word this morning. So why don't we pray and get into the text. Father God, I do pray for grace and mercy. Give us all that we need so that when the time of testing comes, that we stand as well. So bless us now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing we see in the story, and this can be your first heading, is the arrest and release. And that's found in verses 17 to 21, the arrest and the release. Look what it says again in verse 17. But the high priest rose up along with all of his associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid their hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. You know, thinking about arrests, I, I did a Google image search for famous mug shots. Who's appeared? Elvis Presley. He was arrested for going 20 miles an hour over the speed limit in his pink Cadillac. Frank Sinatra, as a young man, he was charged with adultery with a married woman. Mick Jagger was booked on drug possession, so was Paris Hilton. Johnny Carson, or Johnny Cash, rather, was arrested for public drunkenness and indecent exposure. Rush Limbaugh, do you remember that name, the radio host? He was uh, arrested for possessing illegal prescription drugs. Little side note on that, the arresting officer was my brother-in-law, Curtis. <laughs> well, in some of the mug shots, uh, the person is scowling, but in others, they have broad grins on their faces. Al Capone and John Gotti are smiling away for the camera. Neither felt the least bit of shame in being arrested. But you know, whether you should feel shame or not depends on the reason for which you were arrested. I mean, a person arrested for possessing child pornography should be very ashamed. A person arrested for protesting out on a side of an abortion clinic should not be ashamed. Well, writing, and by the way, we specifically shouldn't be ashamed for doing what God has commanded us to do. Writing from prison to his young friend Timothy, the Apostle Paul reminded him that God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. 2 Timothy 1, 7 8. By the way, former President Donald Trump was arrested a while back, but they never released his mugshot. I don't think that's because the DA didn't want to embarrass the former president. It's more likely that he was worried that Trump would use the picture in his next campaign. There's little doubt to me that that arrest was politically motivated. But what motivated the religious leaders to arrest the apostles? Well, Luke tells us that it was simple jealousy. Because the people were flocking to them and being healed, they were bothered by it. But aren't religious leaders motivated by love for God and Concern for the people that they serve? Not always. These leaders actually hated God as evidenced by the fact that they crucified his son. And they had no concern for the people as shown by the fact that they were upset that the people were actually being helped by the apostles. You know, a lot of politicians who talk so much about caring for the poor actually have contempt for them and no concern that the policies that they put in place do more harm than good for the poor. And in the church, there's plenty of pastors who are motivated in doing their ministries not by the glory of God, but simply to feed their own egos. Those sitting in their church are an audience, and they're the star of the show. Paul warned of spiritual charlatans like this in the church when he told the Christians in Philippi, he said, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. Keep your eye on those who live as we do. For I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destination is destruction. Their God is their stomachs. Their glory is their shame. They set their minds on earthly things. What I'm saying is don't be taken in by religious con artists. They may have flashy ministries, but not all that glitters is gold. 
Well, the religious leaders arrested the apostles, but God was the one who actually released them. Look what it says in verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gate of the prison and taking them out said, go and stand and speak to the people in the temple this whole message of uh, life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple at daybreak and began to teach. You know, they say you can't keep a good man down. Well, evidently you couldn't keep God's men in when God wanted them out. And the Holy Spirit wanted them to proclaim the gospel in Jerusalem, and the religious leaders, try as they may, were not going to be able to stop them. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? What they said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, when, they demanded, when he demanded that they bow before his statue or be thrown into the fiery furnace? He said, we don't need to answer you in this matter, O king. If it be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods and we're not going to worship the golden image that you've set up. They didn't bow, they didn't bend, and they didn't burn. God rescued them from death. But I want you to hear this. Many times God does not deliver his people out of death. Rather, he delivers them through death. He doesn't save their life, but through their death, he simply brings them home to heaven. Well, here God did deliver his servants. He sent an angel to facilitate a jailbreak, after which the apostles went right back to preaching in the temple area. That brings us to our second point, perplexity and proclamation. And this is found in verses 21b to 26. Now, the Oxford Dictionary defines perplexity as inability to deal with or understand something of a complicated nature. Now, the religious leaders were faced with a situation for which they had no explanation. We read starting in the second part of verse 21, this, it says, Now, when the high priest and his associates came and called the council together, even all the senate of the sons of Israel, they sent orders to the prison house to have them brought out. But the officer who came did not find them in the prison. And they returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely and the guards standing at the door, but when we opened it up, we found no one inside. I mean, can you imagine the scene? The council's gathered, and the high priest says to the temple guard, uh, Go to the jail. Get those inmates, bring them back in. They arrive. They said, we have orders to take custody of these men. They unlock the door, they go inside, and they find it empty. I mean, did they escape through an air vent? Uh, they hadn't overpowered the guards. Were they smuggled out in a laundry truck? No, they simply vanished. Verse 24 says, Now when the captain of the guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed as to what would come of this. Now, even if the captain of the guards knew what really happened and had told it to the priests, they wouldn't have believed it. Sadducees don't believe in spirits or angels. So they had no interpretive grid by which they could have correctly analyzed the situation. Now, you would think after the jailbreak, the disciples would have head out of town singing the words of a Christopher Cross song. It's night, my body's weak, I'm on the run, no time to sleep. I got to ride, ride like the wind to be free again. And I've got such a long way to go to make it to the border of Mexico. So I ride like the wind, ride like the wind. But, verse 25, someone came and reported, the men that you put in the prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people, that they might be stoned. Now notice that even though they have power over the people, they're still afraid of the people. I mean, even dictators know that if they push public opinion too far against them, they're going to lose grip of power. Well, the religious leaders were perplexed as to how the disciples got out of prison, but they shouldn't have been perplexed as to where they would find them. They were preaching the gospel in the temple just like they were before they were arrested. That brings us to our third point, though, the defense and deliberation. And that's in verses 27 to 39. By the way, in the letter that Peter wrote to some suffering Christians in his day, he said this, Who is there to harm you? if you prove zealous for what is good. But even if you do suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, don't be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your house, heart, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that you have in you. Yet do so with gentleness and reverence. And keep a clear conscience so that in the things in which they slander you, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it's better if God should will it that you suffer for doing what's right rather than doing what's wrong. 1 Peter 3, 13 to 17. Well, the religious leaders here were going to try to intimidate the apostles because it says in verse 27, when they brought them, uh, when they had brought them, 
they stood them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue to teach in this name. And you, yet you filled Jerusalem with your teachings, and you tend to bring this man's blood upon us. I mean, it's not just that we commanded you not to say these things. You're going around telling everyone we're a bunch of murderers. Well, yeah, because you were, and you are. But Peter, verse 29, and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. Now, folks, that's the heart of the conflict, isn't it, in every age? When John MacArthur kept his church open after the L.A. County officials demanded that they close, they began issuing fines and threatening to arrest him. It wasn't about health policies. It was about power and authority. The Bible tells us that we're not supposed to forsake the assembling together of the saints. The government said, you must forsake the assembling together of the saints. Who should we obey, the God? God or government? They have the power to close our churches, but they have no legitimate authority to do so. But in giving his defense, Peter again goes on the offensive, beginning verse 30. Look what he says. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a cross. He's the one that God exalted to his right hand as a prince and savior to grant repentance to uh, Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we're witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. I mean, the man that they had murdered by the hand of Pilate, the governor, who ordered him to be crucified, was not some religious radical who needed to be done away with to maintain the delicate balance of power in Israel. Rather, he was the very son of God who had been sent to be a sacrifice for sins. And having offered up that sacrifice and it being accepted, God the Father then raised Jesus up from the dead and exalted him to the highest place. He is now the prince and savior who alone can grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And as they had told them the last time they arrested him, there's salvation in no one else, for there's no other name given under heaven for us to call on by which we must be saved. You cannot be saved through Judaism or Islam. Buddha can't save you. Kali can't save you. Vishnu can't save you. The Virgin Mary cannot save you. You cannot make it to heaven by doing good or being religious or living a life of service to others. When you stand outside of heaven's gate, and Jesus asks you, what right do you have to come into my kingdom? The only answer that will suffice is nothing in my hands I bring, only to your cross I cling. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And if these wicked religious leaders had turned from their sins at this moment and trusted in Christ's death as a payment for their sins, God would have granted them forgiveness and eternal life as well. A stupid, blinding effect of sin that we should perish in our pride rather than humble ourselves and find eternal life. But the religious leaders weren't thinking about eternal life. They were plotting deaths. He says in verse 33, But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they intended to kill them. These men were of their father the devil, who Jesus said was a murderer from the beginning. Their bloodlust came out of their hatred for the truth and the God of the truth. So they were ready to beat the apostles to death on the spot. But cooler heads prevailed, for we read, starting in verse 34, But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short while. You know, there's uh, Christian organizations that work on college campuses like InterVarsity and Campus Crusade. There's also one for Jews uh, called Hillel International. Now, the name is taken from one of Israel's most famous rabbis, Hillel the Great. Well, Gamaliel, the man in this story, was actually his grandson, who at the time was himself a highly respected member of the Sanhedrin. So he, he starts calming down these hotheads when he says this, Men of Israel, take care what you purpose to do to these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined with him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him, but he too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it'll be overthrown. But if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you might even find, be found fighting against God. Well, Gamaliel is arguing that firebrands and messianic pretenders have come and gone. He cited two recent examples of hotshots who flamed up only to fizzle out later and die. 
I mean, if this Jesus movement started by these men standing outside the room here, if it's from men, well, this too will pass. But if, on the other hand, it's really from God, you're not going to be able to overthrow and you might end up fighting against God himself. Now, doesn't that seem to you to be pretty reasonable thinking? But there's a problem here. It's not that this movement might be from God. It's certain that this movement was from God. The evidence was clear from the miracles the disciples performed and the scriptures that they cited that Jesus was indeed the Prince and Savior of Israel. So his wisdom was good enough to keep the religious leaders from adding to their guilt by killing the disciples, but not good enough to remove their guilt and his own guilt by accepting Jesus as the Messiah. Well, that brings us to our last point, the punishment and prohibition. This is found in verses 40 to 42. It says, Then they took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they released him. The great Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote a book entitled Crime and Punishment. Here there's no crime by the apostles, but yet they still receive a punishment. They're flogged. When a person was flogged by a soldier administering it, he would use a, a whip that was called a flagellum, which consisted of a wooden handle with these leather thongs that came out of it. And tied into the thongs were bits of metal and glass, which would, of course, tear off the flesh with each blow. So this was a terrifying and painful ordeal that they went through. I mean, they wanted to kill the apostles, but they settled on giving them a vicious beating. But they made it clear, as clear as they could to the apostles, that they were forbidden to ever speak in the name of Jesus again. Just this last week, three FBI agents came forward as whistleblowers to testify before the House Committee about the corruption inside the FBI. All three said that they had been targeted by the agency to try to intimidate them to keep them from coming forward. One of the whistleblowers said that many of their fellow agents agreed with them, but they were afraid to come forward for fear of the repercussions and backlash that they would face. They knew what was going on was wrong, but they weren't willing to stand their ground. Instead, they backed down. You know, John Wayne said, courage is being afraid, but saddling up anyways. That sounds bold, but John Wayne was an actor. He only had to pretend to be courageous in the face of danger. These disciples weren't play acting. After the flogging, we're told, though, that so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they'd been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple, and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching, Jesus is the Christ. I mean, these disciples were doing what Jesus told them they were supposed to do in times like these. He said, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, Matthew 5, 11 to 12. Peter put it this way, Beloved, do not be surprised by the fiery ordeals among you, which come upon you for your testing, as though it was some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice in exaltation. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 1 Peter 4, 12-14. It was because the spirit of God rested upon them that they had the courage and boldness to stand their ground and not back down, but instead to keep teaching and preaching Jesus is Christ. And folks, that's what we need in our country today. We need Christians who have the courage to speak up and to speak the truth in a culture filled with lies. We need to reaffirm what the Bible says about sexual roles and sexual identity and the dignity of human life and the certainty of judgment to come and the fact that there is not many ways to heaven but only one. We need people who are convinced both of the truth of the gospel and the power of the gospel to change lives and destinies. We need people who will stand in their jobs and tell the truth and not fear what will happen. Will I get fired? Yeah, you might. Well, will Jesus not take care of you? I remember seeing a, reading a story. It was a guy who was a, um, working with missionaries and he was visiting a missionary who was working in Indonesia. And they were out at a church. And at this church, um, 
a little girl had come to church that day, and she had a suitcase with some things in it. And uh, the missionary who visited the church said, so this little girl, did she, um, did she bring this for show and tell? And they said, no. By the way, she's 10 years old. She said, no. She became a Christian, and when she did, her parents kicked her out and said she can't live there anymore. Everything she owns is in that suitcase. Now let me ask you a question. What would Jesus look like if he abandoned a little 10-year-old girl who had trusted him? Would he? Do you think he'll abandon you if you take a stand for the truth at your job? If you're threatened? I'm not telling you you couldn't lose your job. I'm telling you that he won't abandon you. They didn't, he didn't abandon these guys. And yet some of them eventually paid with their life. Most of them did. But the problem is, is we have too many people who just sit and let things go by and say, well, it doesn't affect me, so it, I don't care. They said, well, as long as they leave me alone, it'll be fine. But they're not leaving us alone, are they? So if we don't stand for truth, who will? May God give us the grace to believe the gospel and also the grace to stand for the gospel. Stand your ground. Don't back down. Let's pray. Our Father and God, I think that most of us are cowards at heart. We've seen in the last couple of years when the government put pressure on for people to get the COVID vaccine and to shut down businesses, and, and they did a lot of things that were not even legal at the time. Most people complied because they were afraid of what would happen to them. Some stood out and as a result paid a price. But Father, we know that uh, it's going to become more difficult in the days to come and we're going to have to stand. But we're only going to be able to stand if you give us the courage to do so. So we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand your word, apply it to our hearts now, and prepare ourselves for the days that might yet come. So bless us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.